Hello everyone, welcome back. We are in the eighth module and uh, the topic is simulation based reliability analysis. So, let us continue our discussion. Today, we are going to learn important sampling. In this topic, we see how we can numerically simulate a random environment and identify how many times a design fails and then based on that information we can estimate probability of failure. Now the complete logic stands on the random number generation based on the random variables that we use to define the limit state. So based on their definition we simulate a large number of samples and then every samples we substitute in the limit state function and check whether the limit state function is less than or equal to 0 or greater than 0. Based on that value, we then define an indicator function which is 1 for failure and 0 for safe design. The reason why we define failure as 1 is that our main objective is to find out the probability of failure. So, for the complete samples that we generate, at the initial stage of Monte Carlo simulation, we count how many times our design fails and then we invoke classical definition of uh, probability where if we have an event A and then N A is the number of samples favorable to that event, then the probability of A is nothing but N A by capital N where capital N is the number of total number of samples. Now, in case of reliability analysis, the main trouble is all our design have very low probability of failure or high reliability. Normally, if you consider an RC structure, even a regular RC structure has probability of failure in the tune of 10 to the power minus 3 to minus 4. Now, to simulate that environment, we need large number of samples. And every time we have, say, a complex finite element model for structural analysis, we need to run that model to check whether we have a failed design or a safe design. And because of this reason only, Monte Carlo simulation takes really large amount of computational effort and time. And that's the reason in many practical situations, we cannot invoke Monte Carlo simulations because of this uh, computational time. And that is the reason our main objective becomes to find out is there any possible way to improve this uh, requirement for very high computational cost. And that motivates us to study this uh, technique what we call important sampling. But before we go into the details of important sampling, let us first revisit the definition of moment that we studied in our first module. So we have a discrete random variable x and its PMF is given by fx of x. Now in this case, if we wish to evaluate the moment of this function, the first moment, we have E of x, I use subscript f just to uh, indicate that this estimation is based on the PMF fx of x. So as per definition, what we have is summation because this is a discrete uh, function. So summation over all possibilities of x, then x times fx of x. So that comes from the definition of first moment. Now, if we have samples and then if we wish to find out the sample mean and then we, ha we have a formula 1 by n summation of i that is all possibilities xi of f. Now, this superscript f indicates that xi is drawn from this PMF defined by f. Now, if we have sufficiently large samples covering the complete space for this x, then obviously we have the sample mean is equal to the mean first moment for this uh, PMF fx of x. Now, if I repeat the same exercise for a different 
PMF and in this case we have another PMF say HX of X and we wish to find out the moment exactly same way so E H of X in this case will be again summation over the complete possibilities of X then X times H X of X and in an exactly similar way we can estimate this first moment based on the samples so we have the sample moment 1 by n summation over i xi and in this case we have superscript h indicating that we draw samples from this pmf hx of x now for some reason just imagine we cannot draw samples from hx of x but we can easily simulate samples from fx of x now in that case, can we use these samples to estimate expected value of x based on h? So that is the problem we wish to investigate. And the answer is yes, probably we can. So we start with the definition of E h of x. Then as per def def definition, it is summation over all possibilities of x, then x times h x of x. Now this we can further modify as summation for all over x then x times so what I introduce hx by f of x so in the denominator we have f of x so that's the reason we multiply this complete thing with another f of x so this f of x cancels effectively we have the same estimation now if you carefully look at this what we have in this case is f of x which is multiplied by x times h by x. So now if we just draw the samples from f then we can use sample mean and in this case 1 by n summation over all i xi drawn from f times hx of xi drawn from f and then fx xi drawn from f. Now obviously this ratio of hx and fx at the sample xi drawn from f we can define it as a weight acting over this samples so that's how it is written here so 1 by n summation of i xi drawn from f and omega i based on f. So we draw samples from f and then based on that we estimate this quantity of omega i f and then that we multiply with x i f and ultimately it gives me the same uh, first moment based on the samples. So effectively we estimate the same moment but in this case we draw samples from f x instead of drawing samples from h x. That's the reason we call fx of x in this case as the important sampling density for this estimation of e of hx. So you can put some numerical num values and just check it yourself. This uh, exercise is very handy. I leave it with you. But the question today is that how we can extend this model for our reliability analysis and that's precisely what we are going to see as we progress in this course. So this is a quick overview of what we call important sampling and as you can see in this case we draw samples from f but we estimate E h of x. So with that background let us see how we can introduce Monte Carlo simulation for reliability analysis and improve it with the help of important sampling method. So recall in Monte Carlo simulations we simulate samples and then based on that again we evaluate sample mean for uh, probability of failure. So in this case based on the value of indicator function whether it is 1 or 0 then uh, we evaluate this and estimate the 
probability of failure. And I have already explained what is the reason uh, this, this model in direct Monte Carlo simulation actually demands for very high computational cost. So, if we introduce a new random variable say j, obviously e of j will be in this case the sample mean what we have here. So, that is expected value of the indicator function i. Now, obviously, this expectation for this uh, indicator function i, we can write down in terms of uh, probability density function, where this x is actually a multivariate case. And that's the reason we have multiple integrals to perform this, so that we can evaluate the probability of failure. Now, if we take a example, this one we have already solved and see what is the situation there, then in this case we have two random variables and the limit state is given here. So, we, I take the same problem what we solved in the last class and then simulate the case. So, what we have here you can see on your screen, all these pink dots are the simulated values of Fy and capital Z. So, that is what we precisely do in Monte Carlo simulations and I plot those simulated points using this pink circle and this blue line you can see on your screen, this represents the limit state function. Now, in this simulation, this is the three dimensional view. So, we have this black line here is basically the level where this gx value is 0, you can see this plane here. So, we have this inclined plane which cuts this 0 plane at this black line. So, that is the limit state. We have solved this problem using first order reliability method. So, this blue star is what is our MPP. And then, if we simulate a sample of say 1000 and this green dots actually are the cases where we have safe design. That means the value of gx is greater than 0. So, it is in the positive domain you can see and this red dots that is where we have failed cases and that is the reason its value is less than 0 and we have this red dots here. Now, as you can see in the original Monte Carlo simulation, we draw samples from Fx, which is the actual distributions of x. And you can see a large number of samples in both the cases are actually in the safe region, which is not required to investigate the failure. because. Our main objective is to find out how many times it fails. However, in this case, you can see only two circles are there on the other side in the failure domain of the limit state. And this is precisely the reason why we waste a huge amount of computational power to simulate all these safe designs. Now, with the background of important sampling that we have discussed in the previous slide, let us see how we can improve this estimate. So, what we do, we rewrite this expression of PF and then in this time, we introduce a new PDF H B of X. So, effectively we have H B of X in the numerator and denominator. So, they cancel and we have the same expression for P of F. Now, this h v of x is what we call the importance sampling density. So, the estimate of p f is nothing but the expectation of this indicator function times f by h. 
so that we can write in this compact form it is nothing but the expected value of i f by h the question is we have to see how best we can uh, define this important sampling and in fact um, the efficiency of the important sampling will depend actually on this um, important sampling density hv so this is overall the definition of important sampling and how we are going to uh, i mean use this uh, concept to improve the simulation. As we progress, we will see how this is going to improve the simulation. So, let us move further. So, what we have is the estimate of PF where we introduce the important sampling density. Now, if we draw samples, Obviously, the sample mean in this case will be 1 by n summation of 1 to n, the values of indicator function times fx divided by h. So, in this case, the sample values are guided by the important sampling function hv and we can also estimate the variance of j in this case. So, variance of j will be 1 by n, variance of i f by h, obviously. That comes from the algebra of variance that we discussed uh, earlier. And we can write down the expressions also for this case. You can recall this first part is nothing but the uh, second moment minus mean square. So, Now, if we wish to minimize this variance, so in order to minimize that uh, variance, what we have to do, we have to select the important sampling density in such a way that ultimately this variance of j is equal to 0. Why that is the case? If that is the case, obviously our estimation for this pf will be exactly same of the sample mean and variance 0 means it will the first estimate of this j will give us accurate estimation of pf now ideally speaking the optimal important sampling function takes the form of this and in that case um, if we use this function then we can directly uh, reduce the variance to 0 and that is the reason this is called variance reduction technique. So, what we have is in this expression you can see we have multiple integrals and it will be identical with j and this variance of i by i f by h if the integrand this, this thing does not change sign and the optimal function can be obtained as this expression. Now, of course, in our uh, important sampling, we can uh, identify the optimal function, but we will see a good choice of important sampling will also give us a very accurate result that we will discuss as we progress in this course. So, we have for the time being, we have PF which is approximated by the sample mean based on the new variable defined as i f by h where h is the important sampling and the optimal important sampling density you can see on your screen. Now, the reason why it is difficult to estimate this h v at the first instance is that for the we need to evaluate this j function. So, at the beginning we do not have the estimate of j and that is the reason uh, we cannot straight away find out the optimal important sampling density. However, we can start with some approximation of j and then we can use that to further improve it. So, 
as the iteration progresses in the further steps the variance is reduced if this expression is less than 1 and that's how this model for important sampling is actually implemented for reliability analysis. Obviously, if we have the optimal choice, in the first instance, we will have um, variance going towards 0 or otherwise we have to um, iteratively solve it. Now, obviously, the efficiency of important sampling technique lies on the detection of the region of failure. So, you can see this uh, diagram actually shows us most of our sampling is carried out in the safe region and that's the reason a large part of the computational effort is actually wasted. So more and more we have samples in the failure region, we can accurately detect the probability of failure. Now the first task that actually comes out of, of this discussion is that we have to identify the failure region first and for that matter we can use this MPP as the reference point because from first order reliability analysis we already have idea about the first point of failure and we can use that as reference and then based on that uh, we can sample in and around that region so that we have sufficient samples in the failure region. This I will show you as we take some numerical examples. Now, obviously it is better to restrict sampling in the region that does not contribute to the failure. So, if we have more samples in the safe region that we should restrict because it unnecessarily consumes the computational cost. And uh, we can start with a trial sampling function and then once we have that, uh, we can improve as we continue the simulation process. So, the important sampling actually goes like this. The steps are as follows. So, we start with the basic definition of uh, a reliability problem. That means, we define limit state and the random variables. They are correlated and can be uh, non-normal. So, let us consider the most general case. So, if they are correlated, we have the correlation matrix and from that we can actually find out the transformation matrix. So, that is the first step. Next is find the design point X star using level 2 method which I have already stated that we have done already the first order reliability method and then we can use that point as the reference point simply because that will give us the best estimate of the failure region. So, Using that X star from the level 2 method and assuming all variables are uncorrelated because in the previous step we have done the Eigen analysis, we refer this X star as the sampling point. Then we generate random numbers. If you recall our discussion in the previous lecture, we always start with the uniform random numbers and then we convert into the desired uh, distributions. However, these days when we use, uh, say, MATLAB, we have inbuilt options to directly generate the random numbers. But for the generic case, we start with the uniform random numbers between 0 to 1 for each random variable and then we convert them. For example, if we have a standard normal where the GX is defined, so we convert these random numbers into standard normal space using the model that you can see on your screen, you can identify this is the uh, box muller algorithm. And then uh, we define a region over which we try to simulate. So, this uh, constant SDM which ranges from 1 to th 3 is simply because we use this factor to define the domain within which we simulate our sample. So, if x is normal, obviously mean plus minus 3 sigma mostly covers the 99 percent region and that is the reason we have this to control the range over which we simulate the samples. Once 
the samples are generated then we evaluate gx if gx is less than 0 that means we have a failure then we proceed or else we go to step 3 we again regenerate random numbers and that's how we covered the complete set of samples where capital N we have already discussed how to estimate. Now once we have a failure case in this step obviously we go to the next step. In the next step we find out again if you have non-normal distributions so we find out mean and standard deviation and then using that we find out the z point corresponding to that equivalent normal values of mean and standard deviation. Then in this space we again uncorrelate using the transformation matrix that we have already discussed. Then finally what we do in the important sampling we find out the probability density functions at that point and then also the important sampling density. Now if you look at this we can go for an optimal important sampling density function but in general we use uncorrelated multidimensional normal random variable. So that's the sampling density for importance sampling we use for reliability analysis here. However, we can uh, introduce any other uh, optimal density function but because normal random variable is symmetric about the reference point. So in this case we consider x star which is from the first order reliability analysis that is MPP as our design point. So obviously we expect half of the distribution will be in the failure domain while half of that will be in the safe region. That is the reason we expect to have large number of samples and uh, the experience have shown that this multidimensional normal distribution actually works well and uh, gives a good estimate of probability of failure that we will see as we take up some example. Then what we do we calculate this ratio hx sorry fx and hx and once we do that we repeat the steps from 3 to 12 again for the complete set of ns and then we can estimate the variance this is the estimation of variance and once we do that based on the indicator function we can calculate probability of failure. So in this case probability of failure is 1 by ns that is the total number of samples summation of i ranging from 1 to n as many failures we have. So we have indicator functions times fx divided by hx sampled at xi. And we can also estimate the amount of error we have and this comes from the analysis of um, confidence interval that we have already discussed. So we have the standard deviation based on that we can calculate this um, error in estimation. So that is the flow chart. So we start with the number of random variables and then uh, we uncorrelate them and then go to the standard normal space and then uh, we start the iteration. We generate samples in the multinormal density and then based on the value of gx whether it is less than 0 or greater than 0, uh, we accordingly we choose the path. If it is yes, it is a failure case then we go to the step where we estimate this uh, weight and then uh, we sum it up. And then finally once the complete loop is done for the ns samples then we estimate pf as sum divided by ns that comes from the classical definition of probability so that's the important sampling technique that we use so let us consider this example so we have uh, in this case again the cantilever beam and in this case again uh, we have uh, two random variables which are following normal distribution and if you note that the domain is controlled by this ASDM which is equal to 1 in this case. We can change this according to our need. 
So first we again uh, check the transformation matrix. Then in the second step, we find out the design point which comes from MPP. And then uh, we go for standard normal random variables. Then we generate sample points in the X space. Then we check the value of the limit state function. And based on the value of the limit state function, which is again the indicator function, we repeat the steps that I have already explained. And then we find out the equivalent uh, normal if the need be. And then based on that, we again uncorrelate and then find out the ratio of Hx uh, and Fx. And then finally, we estimate the probability of failure. So that's the result. So in this case, you can see we start with 200 samples and then in the next iteration we go to 500 and then finally 1000 samples. And every time we estimate PF and also estimate error. And you can see as we increase the number, our error in estimation of PF reduces drastically. Not only that, you can also note that in this case, uh, the number of samples, it is much less than um, that we use for Monte Carlo simulation. So that's the main uh, advantage. Now, if I graphically show you what is the meaning of that, you can see here, again, the same thing. So we have 1000 samples for the same limit state. Now, if you compare with the important sampling, as you can see, we use this star, that means the MPP as the anchor point, and we use multi-variate normal distribution as our important sampling distribution in this case. And in fact, in all the analysis, we'll use multivariate normal and uncorrelated um, variable as our important sampling density. You can easily see we have large number of samples in the failure region. And that's the reason we need significantly less number of samples to achieve the same um, quality of end result compared to Monte Carlo simulation. So that's the graphical representation. And that's what is reflected in the number of samples and the amount of error that we get in our estimation. So if we continue our discussion, so in this case, we have um, non-normal distributions. And we have three random variables. Again, we use uh, SDM value as one that defines the domain for um, important sampling. So in this case, we have um, correlated random variables. So variable one and two are correlated. So obviously, in this case, we have to uncorrelate them. For that, we have the transformation matrix. And then in the second step, we find out what is X star and that comes from the first order reliability method. We use the same information because ultimately we are going to verify whether the estimation from first order reliability analysis is correct or not. So we use that same point because otherwise, uh, uh, if the reference point is not good, we may need to iterate more and more to estimate the probability of failure accurately. In fact, uh, as we progress, we'll see that. So then what we do, we go to the standard normal space. And then again, we um, find out the samples there. And then based on that, we evaluate GX. Then we check the values of GX. Once we do that, then again, um, the standard normal random variables. And then finally, we evaluate the FX and hx. So then we get the ratio of fx and hx, that is the weight. And then based on that, we evaluate pf. Now, if you see the results, it is here. In this case, again, we start with 500 samples, then we go to 1000 and finally 1500 samples. And as we increase the number of samples, error in PF estimation reduces. And you can see this number of samples are 
significantly less than the amount of um, NS we need to have in case of Monte Carlo simulation. Now, obviously, the question comes, in all these previous examples, we have used MPP as our reference point. So, basically, we solved the reliability problem first using first order reliability method, which tells us the optimal uh, point on the limit state. And then, to verify that result, we invoke uh, important sampling. And for that, we use the same MPP and uh, just uh, use a multivariate uncorrelated normal distribution as our important sampling density. And using that, we solve the reliability problem. The question comes, uh, if we do not solve the gradient based reliability and we do not know uh, the MPP, then what happens? Obviously, if we have the MPP on the limit state, which actually, I mean, demarcates the region for failure and safe, then um, this is the ideal choice because this point where we have first failure will give us the accurate estimation of this reliability index beta. So, the cases where we can have uh, an idea of this MPP, obviously there is no point of using any other point because this will be the best location to place the important sampling density. And then uh, even uh, if we use normal random variable as our important sampling density, that also gives us a very um, efficient result provided we use this ideal choice for our important sampling analysis. But what happens when we use any other point, which is obviously a poor choice compared to the previous one, then we can start this iteration, obviously at this location, because of this uh, point, it is uh, not so efficient compared to this MPP, but we can use any other point we can improve this result based on the simulated samples that we have in and around this region. So, we can check the distance of this point from the origin and just uh, improve this selection of reference point further and that is how also we can employ important sampling for the cases where we do not uh, use first order reliability method initially to get the reference point. So, in this case, again, it is important sampling, exactly same uh, technique, but we change the reference point as we progress and that is the reason it is called adaptive sampling. The reason why we sometimes need to go for adaptive sampling is that uh, it is very difficult to have a good sampling density and reference point at the very beginning. If it is known, obviously, that is the best choice, otherwise, we can invoke for adaptive sampling method. So, it can start with a poor initial choice and then as we get the estimate of failure, then we can further increase this case. So, after each sample, the important sampling density can be modified according to uh, the need uh, to obtain a good sampling density function. So, we can change this uh, reference point and the estimations. And this is achieved by choosing the sample points having more probability density as the new center of sampling density. That is how we uh, improve this. Obviously, we have to go through the steps. I will show you in a minute. So, the steps involved in the procedure for computation of PF using uh, adaptive sampling is almost same except the fact that we uh, keep on improving the estimation as we progress in an iterative manner. So, in this method, in step 2, what we do at any point xc that we can select as our starting point, the reason is 
we do not have the MPP in this case, so we start with any reference point, say Xc, for the mean of the sampling density. And at this point, the original variables are converted into independent normal variables, the same way we have done using X star. And then the probability density at this point Xc is calculated as independent multinormal density. Just now we have discussed that using examples. So the same way we anchor the multinormal density function at this Xc point and then we estimate the weight and evaluate the estimate of Pf. So the logic goes like this. We start again the same way. We follow all this but in this case in the second step here earlier case we had MPP but in this case we have a reference point or starting point as Xc. Then we estimate this uh, function as we progress we define sum equal to 0 and then uh, we start the simulation. Obviously again As we progress, we generate the random numbers and then uh, for each variable and then uh, we generate the sample points in and around Xc. Based on that sample point, we basically for estimate Gx. If it is less than 0, then obviously that is corresponding to failure. Then we find Fx and Hx. Once we do that, we find out this weight and then we sum it up. If it is not zero, that is the safe case, then again we repeat, we go for the next simulation and that's how we repeat the procedure. And again, we continue this for the complete set of NS and then finally we evaluate PF as the ratio of this sum that gives us the estimate of this Fx and Hx and then divide that sum by ns using classical definition of probability we estimate the probability of failure. So let us consider an example in this case again the same uh, example I use to show you. So remember uh, earlier case we used MPP as our reference point. Now in this case uh, we consider a different initial point. So our initial point is 40 and 25 instead of the MPP that we estimated earlier. And then uh, we simulate for 200 samples. So you can see the important sampling. This we have studied earlier. And then this is adaptive sampling. Uh, we have more samples in this case in the failure region. And that's because we adaptively track this region and then we start with a sample point which is 40, 25. So in this case, 40 and then 25 somewhere here. Yes, this pink initial point, you can see this star here. And then we gradually progress over this point and that's how we simulate in this region. But in case of important sampling, if I use that as my reference point, I have uh, some of the samples uh, which are not close to the MPP, you can see. And of course, in this case, the estimates will not be accurate if I use uh, a different, different point as my anchor point. However, in case of adaptive sampling, as we progress based on the sample values, we evaluate uh, the functional values of PDF and then based on that, we uh, change this anchor point and gradually move towards this uh, MPP. So you can see for the same samples, in case of adaptive sampling, we have an error of 17.1%. However, the same in case of important sampling is close to 42%. So in this case, obviously, we have used 200 samples. The moment we increase the samples, this error in estimation of PF drops. But just for comparison, for the same sample size, if we use a different anchor point, Important sampling provides a large amount of error, while adaptive sampling uses the same anchor point, but because it is adaptively increasing the 
points in the failure domain, its estimate is far better compared to important sample. So this shows how we can incorporate important sampling and its adaptive version for the reliability analysis. So once we estimate probability of failure, obviously, then our next task is to find out beta and that also we can take using inverse transformation because pf is phi of minus beta. So obviously, we can estimate beta from the probability of failure that we estimate from this numerical simulation. So this covers the variance reduction technique uh, using important sampling or its adaptive version, which is uh, there in our syllabus in this course. But before I close, I wish to give uh, you uh, some idea about other simulation techniques that also we can adapt effectively to solve reliability problem. And one of them is what we call Latin hypercube sampling. Now, this is a very efficient technique. In this, uh, what we do, we have sampling for capital NS and we have uh, these values from prescribed distributions of each of the k variables. So, we have say k different random variables in the definition of limit state. The only uh, difference in this case what we do from the previous sampling techniques is that in this case the cumulative distributions of each variable is subdivided into n equiprobable intervals. I will show you the schematic diagram in a minute in two dimensions that will show you how we can do that. The number of intervals capital N depends on the total number of samples that we generate and the dimension of each interval depends on the distribution of the variables x. So the value is selected randomly from each interval unlike uh, sample random sampling. This method ensures full coverage because we consider the complete CDF and that we subdivide into equiprobable intervals. So it covers the complete range satisfying each marginal distribution and that's how it actually covers the complete domain. Now if I show you the figure in two dimensions, so we have so x2 that is the cumulative density of x2 and then we have x1. So in this case also CDF you can see on your screen. What we do? We subdivide this complete domain into equiprobable ranges and then we map it in the xy plane and if you notice that every combinations corresponding to each segment in the cumulative distribution is actually represented here. So for example, say this one, here it covers this range of probability for x1 while the same variable covers this range of probability for x2. So that's how in every square block you see you will get at least one point covering the complete domain. So that's how we randomly spread the samples over the complete domain by subdividing the CDF into equiprobable intervals. So if I summarize this Latin hypercube sampling, we divide the cumulative distributions into uh, n equiprobable intervals. Then from each interval, we select a value randomly. For the ith interval, the sampled cumulative probability can be written as, you can see the expression. And then once we do that, we then transform that probability values sampled in this step into x and then using inverse uh, transformation, we can find out this x. Once we do that, we then have n values obtained for each variable x and they are paired randomly so that we get random pairs as you can see here in this square block. And that's how each segment of this uh, CDF for 
all the random variables are actually covered and once we have this then what we do we use these samples to evaluate the probability of failure now this latin hypercube sampling it is based on the assumption that the variables are independent of each other however in actual case we do not have uh, always random variables which are independent we have correlated case but once we have the correlated case then we know how to uncorrelate them so first we employ for example cholesky decomposition or eigen analysis then uh, we can uncorrelate them and if i summarize that uh, so we start with a correlation matrix so first we generate matrix r using latin hypercube sampling for k variables at the sample size ns then we calculate t that transformation matrix um, then uh, we can employ lower and upper triangular matrix to um, uncorrelate the system and then uh, once we do that we finally have um, this calculated target correlations so that um, from the uncorrelated space we can actually map the correlated space then uh, once we do that our task is to solve the gx and then based on that we find out probability of failure so let us quickly take an example now again the same problem we have considered so in this case again we can uh, estimate this all these matrices uh, you can see on your screen and then finally if i just show you the simulated samples you can see if we use say monte carlo simulations we have far less number of samples compared to um, latin hypercube sampling now if we just sum it up uh, you can see the results for the same sample size uh, we have a better estimate of pf compared to uh, monte carlo simulations and that's simply because we in this method we cover the complete domain using equiprobable range and that's how we try to place at least one samples while uh, i mean selecting uh, samples from the marginal density functions although this is not part of our syllabus but this is just to give you an idea that there are other sampling techniques which can be efficient for your problem so those who are interested to uh, use it further they can also try uh, latin hypercube sampling and in some of the problems uh, it is very handy to use uh, latin hypercube sampling to estimate the probability of failure otherwise the main focus of uh, this lecture was variance reduction and uh, for that we have introduced important sampling a very efficient technique where we use uh, the solution from the first order reliability analysis as the reference point and based on that reference point we anchor our sampling density function what we call important sampling density and there we assume it to be multivariate normal and then uh, using that sampling density we estimate the probability of failure and uh, the case where we have no estimate of mpp then we can adaptively use this important sampling just by starting from a reference point and then we can improve based on the values of uh, limit state function and uh, the density function that we have and we can adaptively modify the results based on important sampling we call it adaptive sampling so both these two together uh, they are very efficient to solve uh, numerically the reliability index and probability of failure and uh, the results i have shown you there we need very less number of samples compared to um, monte carlo simulations so you can uh, solve some more examples uh, we have discussed many other examples you can try those examples at your end um, and then just verify the results and compare your results with monte carlo simulations and uh, in case if you have any difficulty of course please let us know and then we can help you 
to solve those problems. With that, let us close our discussion on important sampling. Thank you. Thank you.